Welcome to the afternoon session of uh, algebraic and complex geometry. So uh, I have the pleasure to be the chair of uh, this session this afternoon. The first speaker for us today is Dan Abramovich from Brown University. And he's going to talk on resolving singularities of varieties and families. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a great privilege to speak here, uh, so I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me, and I very much would like to thank you for coming. I know you have lots and lots of options in this river of mathematics. Um, so I'll speak about resolving singularities of varieties and families of varieties, and my, one of my goals is to play them against each other because one informs the other. Of course, uh, the resolution of singularities of varieties is necessary for families of varieties, but surprisingly, we have some surprising uh, ideas coming back. Um, this is joint work with uh, Michael Tjomkin and Jaroslav Vordacic, uh, who are sources of uh, quite a bit of vision in the subject of resolution of singularities. <laughs> um, you must have heard resolution of singularities portrayed as, um, as uh, a way to remove uh, ugly and undesirable singularities and uh, replace them by nice and, uh, and uh, smooth uh, varieties. So remove something ugly and undesirable like this. Where is Andras? Or, uh, so, so you agree this is ugly? You don't like lemons? Uh, how about this? Okay, I, I, I was hoping for some audience participation. Of course, these are not ugly. These are uh, figures by Herwig Hauser. If you spend any time with Herwig Hauser, you know that some singularities are actually beautiful. Uh, so the question is, why do we do this? Why do we do this crime of replacing singularities by something boring and smooth? Um, okay, so I think I have this. Why do we get rid of them? Uh, so there is a fundamental reason, which I will say in a, in a moment, but mathematicians are kind of, they don't like fundamental reasons. They want applications, so I'll actually give you a couple of applications, one in the study of singularities and one in the study of the structure of varieties, which are evidence for the value of resolution of singularities. So let's uh, first go and quickly, I don't think everybody here is an algebraic geometer, evidently not. Um, so uh, let's uh, remind ourselves what we mean by singularities and what we mean by resolution of singularities. So um, we define, so th this is uh, very much like uh, in Berkar's lecture, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so if you have one equation, if you have a hypersurface, it is singular at the point P on the hypersurface if all the derivatives are zero, just like when you discuss manifolds inside Rn. Um, otherwise, it is smooth. Um, in other words, it is smooth if and only if F equals zero defines a submanifold of complex co-dimension one. Uh, in codimension C, it's a little bit more complicated, but we all have learned differential geometry, and we know that the set uh, of common loci of K equations is smooth when the uh, uh, derivative uh, has constant rank C, or, or if you wish, when the Jacobian has constant rank, the codimension. I hope I got it right. <coughs> and Another thing that we know is that the smooth locus on a variety is open. This is not always true in algebraic geometry, but for varieties it's true. Uh, so let us remind ourselves of another aspect that uh, uh, was discussed in two lectures, both Shoes lectures and, and Birkars. Uh, what is resolution of singularities? And I want this, spe this specific uh, meaning. A resolution of singularities is a modification in other words, a proper birational map, like a blowing up, with uh, the variety on top uh, being uh, non-singular, 
and uh, the, I want to be specific that I want it to be an isomorphism over the smooth, over the open set where x is uh, smooth. Um, and of course, the, uh, one of the great results in rational geometry, the, perhaps the first Fields medal in birational algebraic geometry is the theorem of Hironaka in 1964, which says that a variety of a, a, a field of characteristic zero admits a resolution of singularities, um, and moreover, uh, it admits a resolution so that the critical locus, what we call the exceptional locus, uh, but for differential geometry, it's, it's just a critical locus, uh, is a simple normal crossing device, namely a union of co-dimension one. Uh, strata, smooth strata, um, meeting transversely, which is as simple a, a critical locus as you can imagine. So this is uh, Hironaka, and following Hironaka, my entire lecture will be in characteristic zero. This is very unfortunate, but um, there's little, well, okay, you can ask me later what, what you want to ask. <coughs> so what is the fundamental importance of resolution of singularities, I think uh, algebraic geometry is a subject that is fortunate that any geometry is global smooth geometry packed very tightly in a very spe precise sense which is uh, described, well, sorry, in characteristic zero, that is true. Every geometry is smooth global geometry packed tightly in a precise sense uh, made here. And, okay, so, as I said, mathematicians are funny. They don't quite uh, get impressed by fundamental notions. So you want um, people like applications. So here's a, uh, an example of an invariant that is proven to be an invariant of a singularity using resolution of singularities. Or one way to prove it is using resolution. So I'll define something that... Uh, I believe Shen Yang, was it Shen Yang who introduced? Or maybe more than one person introduced last week. If you have a resolution of singularities of a variety X with critical locus E or exceptional locus E, um, which is a simple normal crossing divisor, you, or you can define the dual complex of E as usual. So for every complex you put a point, for every intersection component of the, uh, of the uh, components you put a, uh, an edge, so this is all you get here, and if these three were to meet in one point, you would fill in this triangle, and you would get sort of a sheet uh, filling in, and if you had two points where they meet, you would sort of get a pillowcase. So you, had, you have a, a very simple geometry attached to a singularity, I think in Andres' talk, we heard something a bit more precise than that, but this is all I will, need, I will use for this example. There's a wonderful theorem, which is, uh, it's very hard to know where precisely uh, um, all the attributions must go, but certainly Stepanov proved it. Um, the simple, namely piecewise linear, homotopy type of this complex is independent of the choice of the resolution. So it gives that homotopy type is an invariant of the singularity. And clearly it, uh, it is an interesting invariant and uh, there are cases where it can be shown to be contractible and cases where it's not. So you know, for instance, that when it's not contractible, the singularity is not rational. Um, I wrote below that beyond, yeah, before Stepanov, there was Danilov, I think I neglected to mention Berkovic, uh, Champagne, Amorit uh, uh, This year, uh, Harper put a, a paper on the archive generalizing this to uh, algebraic stacks. <coughs> so that's one example of why we care about, why we do this crime of taking something beautiful and making it smooth and boring. Uh, the second answer is uh, that it tells us something about the structure of varieties in general. And, um, okay, you've heard me quote this sentence by Vistoli many times. Um, 
so you can read it on your own if you haven't. It's a very, I find it very inspiring. Um, and so he, already when Hironak approved resolution singularities, he, he uh, pointed out the following corollary. A smooth quasi-projective variety has a smooth projective compactification whose uh, boundary is a simple normal crossings divisor. And that's just because any variety, that's something very nice in algebraic geometry, every variety has a compactification and um, any quasi-projective variety has a compactification. And you resolve that compactification in the sense that I stated. So here's the compact compactification resolved. <coughs> That's a little bit about resolution of singularities, but I want to say something uh, that is not 40-something uh, or 50 forget uh, how many years old. Um, so let's ask ourselves, what way can we say about resolving singularities of a family of varieties? This is something I've been obsessed about uh, for quite some time, and I hope to convince you that it's interesting. But the key question to begin with is, when do we agree that the singularities of a morphism are simple? When do we agree that, in some sense, all the fibers are as, as uh, nice, uh, I shouldn't say nice because of what I said, as simple as possible. <coughs> so in the case of dimension one, there's a very uh, uh, um, complete answer in, in Curtis here. Um, if the dimension of the base is one, um, the simplest one can have by just modifying x is a monomial uh, sort of equation for the fibers, just like this. So this is an outcome of Hironaka's uh, theorem. As I, as I mentioned, I'm working in characteristic zero all the time, okay? Um, and if one also allows base change of this type, then, uh, then there's a fairly subtle result of Kemp, Knudsen, Mumford, and Sandona from 1973, uh, which says we can improve on that by removing multiplicities and keeping the total space non-singular. So that's what they call semi-stable one-parameter family. So what I drew here is the case of a two-dimensional uh, variety mapping to a one-dimensional variety as required here. And in the two-dimensional case, it's just a product. So this is uh, S equals T1, T2, oh, X1, S equals X1, X2 near this singular point of the fiber. This is as non-singular as you can get um, a one-parameter family. And the question I want to ask uh, first is, what makes this kind of singularities or this kind of morphisms special? Why are these really the best? And my answer to this is that they are log smooth. So let's uh, recall something that was already mentioned again in an earlier talk. Sorry, I keep doing, making the mistake that others. Okay. So a toric variety is a normal, normal variety on which C star to the n acts algebraically with a dense free orbit. And a Zariski locally, uh, so a toric variety is characterized uh, by the fact that it's a normal variety locally defined, the risk is locally defined by equations between monomial, namely binomial equations. Um, the issue with these is that all of these are rational, so uh, they don't seem to say something about arbitrary varieties. And this uh, phenomenon, which I like to call the unreasonable effectiveness of toric varieties, uh, which says that, in fact, if you look locally, then you, they say a whole lot if you allow yourself to weaken the condition. So a variety with a divisor D is toroidal or log smooth. If a tal locally, so the difference is now a tal locally, it looks like a toric variety with its toric divisor. So this is uh, just the boundary of the toric variety. So I, I want the, boundary, the variety with its boundary to locally, a tal locally, or if you want formally or in the Euclidean topology uh, to look like a toric variety with its boundary. 
which means that a tau local it is defined by monomial equations, uh, by binomial equations. Um, a morphism between, so, okay, we have to define morphisms. So a morphism between uh, toroidal variety is, uh, toroidal varieties is toroidal or logarithmically smooth if a tau local it looks like what you would call a toric morphism, namely a torus equivariant uh, dominant, I left out, dominant morphism of toric varieties. Um, these are characterized by the, by the statement that um, I'll, I'll show here, that the, when you pull back a monomial on Y, it becomes a monomial on X, where here a monomial is um, uh, a function whose vanishing locus is um, supported on the boundary. Okay. So let's go back to our questions. When are the singularities of a morphism simple? And I claim, and there's a, a very nice result in Carus thesis that shows that this is, in fact, the best one can hope for. I claim that the best that one can hope for is a semi-stable morphism. So, um, and I just uh, described what a semi-stable morphism uh, here. So the definition appears in, uh, in a paper with Caro uh, in 2000. A log smooth morphism with, where the base is smooth is semi-stable if locally it is given by um, equations each of the variable is a, mono, is a reduced monomial, and these monomials are relatively prime. In other words, this is the absolute product of several families of one parameter families of, with semi stable degeneration. Okay, so locally it looks like this. Um, in particular, it's log smooth, so it's not just that I have e equations here, but all these variables are monomials, are, they are defining equations of boundary devices. Uh, in particular, uh, so, okay, um, I want to uh, just mention that a, a very similar, well, this definition with a slightly different name is given in a, in a concurrent paper by Berkovich. Uh, both of us, uh, I mean both Caro and I and Berkovich were inspired by the work of De Jong. How am I doing? <coughs> okay. Um, so, the ultimate goal is a semi stable reduction problem. So, to solve the semi stable reduction problem. So, the conjecture that uh, Carol and I made in the same paper is that and it's, a, it's a rephrasing of something that appeared uh, without uh, precise equations in Kempf Nutz and Manfosa and Dona is that if x to b is a dominant morphism of varieties, then there is a base change. In a, uh, the, the, the word that needs to be used is an alteration, a proper um, subjective and generically finite morphism, b1 to b, and the modification of the, of the, of the pullback, so of the main part of the pullback. So the pullback might have stuff that does not dominate the base, so you just take the stuff that dominates the base. That's the main, main comp oops, that's a collection of main components. So there is a, mod a base change and a, and a modification such that the new mapping is a semi-stable family. Uh, this is a somewhat, uh, I, called it, I call it the loose version of the conjecture. We actually stated, um, this in a remark. Uh, if, if you start with something with a smooth generic fiber, you'd rather not change the smooth generic fiber. In fact, you want the procedure to be, in some sense, functorial. So I'll, I'll make that more precise later when I actually state the results. Um, so, uh, the next, uh, in the next few slides, I'll, s I'll say something about 
uh, why the loose version is already valuable, in fact, something weaker than the loose version is already valuable, and then say something about the tight version. So we do want the tight version. If you have a family of varieties and you want to compactify it where the fi all the fibers are as uh, simple as possible, namely you want to compactify it by a semi-stable family or something of the nature, you'd better have the tight version. You don't want to change what's already there. Um, I'll describe a project, a progress towards the tight version. So uh, the new result I want to uh, mention are, are about the tight version. Um, and, uh, but the, the next few uh, slides are about the loose version. Um, there, I want to make mention that already Kemp Knudsen's Manfred Sandona uh, had the result on a one parameter base. Every, everything that follows uses the toroidal um, language that they introduce. And, uh, and, and of course, De Jong in, uh, had uh, wonderful results, which uh, a lot of what I will describe follows. Um, and moreover, De Jong, followed by Gaber, Iluzi, and Tiomkin, proved wonderful results in characteristic P, which I will not focus on today, but they are on a, of a very similar nature to what I discussed, described today. <coughs> so back to characteristic zero. Uh, here's what's key to, um, to getting towards uh, a semi-stable reduction. Uh, so the first uh, result is what I call toroidalization. It's in the same paper with Caro, um, which says that without base change, just modifications of both the bases and the total, uh, total space, uh, or the main components of the total space, there is a modification and, and a modification of the total space such that the new family might not be semi-stable, but at least it is logarithmically smooth, namely given by equations between monomial and flat, in particular, equidimensional. <coughs> so that's uh, sort of our uh, first step. Then uh, with uh, quite a bit of geometry and combinatorics, uh, we proved what we call the weak semi-stable reduction theorem, which says that after a base change, beyond the modification, we take a further base change and uh, modify the total space uh, in such a way that the total space is log smooth, flat, and with reduced fiber. This is what we call weakly semi-stable. It's not quite uh, semi-stable, but uh, I claim, and I want to convince you, that this is already valuable for some purposes. So this is a result from 2000. Uh, I should say that if passing from semi-stable reduction to uh, weak semi-stable reduction to semi-stable reduction is a purely combinatorial problem, which we stated as a conjecture in that paper. Um, that was proven by Karu for families of surfaces and threefolds in his thesis. And um, there's news from June. Um, so when I prepared the lecture, I thought I would give something for young people to think about. But I'm sorry. It was solved. Uh, there's, uh, um, so my collaborator, Tjomkin, has a, a combinatorialist uh, colleague. And so they joined forces. And they proved the semi-stable reduction, uh, the, 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 the passage from weak semi-stable reduction to semi-stable reduction. Um, together with uh, two more people, Gakul Yu, who is a, pro, uh, a postdoc of Karim, and Igor Pak. So they proved it um, in the case of rank one valuation rings. Um, let me not get too much into the details. The paper is on the archive. Um, but uh, discussing this with them, it seems that uh, the, the key lemma is strong enough that it will prove the semi-stable reduction um, conjecture in characteristic zero in, um, with a little bit of effort. 
So I, I, I'm sorry, I cannot suggest it as a, as a problem for young people. Too late. So why do I make so much fuss about weak semi-stable reduction? Um, I want to suggest that weak semi-stable reduction, even in the loose sense where I change the generic fiber, is still valuable. And so I'll, I'll state a couple of applications of weak semi-stable reduction. This is a result uh, in carosthesis, which in modern times, after BCHM, can be stated as follows. Um, the moduli space of stable, smoothable varieties is projective. So you look at those varieties that appear in, uh, in KSBA moduli space as, as the limits of smooth varieties, uh, the moduli space of those is projective. Um, the key result was proving uh, that it's bounded and proper. Uh, the early result of uh, Kohler, Shepard, Bauer, and, uh, and, and Alexeyev was sufficient for other aspects of, of being projective. Um, and that, that used uh, the result of um, Siu and Kawamata on the formation invariance of pluregenera that, was just a, that had just appeared at the time. Um, here's another application by Fiveg and Zuo from 2004, which says that the moduli space of canonically polarized manifolds is broadly hyperbolic, namely any holomorphic map from C to the moduli space is constant. Um, and here's another application due to Fujino, which is just last year on, on the archive. If you want to prove uh, Itaka's, the logarithmic version of Itaka's subadditivity conjecture, uh, I mean, most people need the abundance conjecture, which we don't have. And this is as much as uh, Fujino. Uh, so Fujino found a way to prove something uh, definite without abundance conjecture, the abundance conjecture. Uh, so there's a notion of numerical logarithmic Kodari dimension, and that is semi-additive, just as in Itaka's project. So I think these are, uh, these give evidence that uh, weak semi-stable reaction is of some value. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so let me state the main result, and uh, to be honest, the result is work in progress. So we believe we've written, we've solved the main new part. We have uh, sort of cut and paste the rest of the argument, uh, and we, so we have a very rough draft of this, uh, but again, it's a, it's a rough draft, so take it. I hope uh, nobody is angry at me for importing or something that is not on the archive. So the main result is uh, functorial toroidalization. So it, this is uh, the analog of um, the toroidalization result with Caro, but making it more precise that allows us to... So this is the input for a tight version of semi-stable reduction, of results of semi-stable reduction type. So stating it is a little bit complicated. Uh, so this is, again, it's joined with Chomkin and Rodacic. Uh, I have a dominant morphism of varieties, so think of it as a singular family. There are, there's a modification of the base and a modification of the main component of the pullback, such that the, the, um, the new family is log smooth and flat. That's what already is proven in in the result with Karu, but this is compatible with further base change and it is factorial up to base change with any logarithmically smooth map uh, x prime, double prime to x. So think about just um, taking an open set of uh, x, the procedure is uh, compatible with taking an open set, so in particular you can glue it uh, over, over patches. Um, if you ask me at the end, I might be able to explain what functorial up to base change it means, but let's, let's keep it at that. 
So as I, I said here, this implies a tight version of results of semi-stable reduction type. And for me, it says something about what is the structure of families of varieties. Every family can be um, modified to something that is, that is log smooth and flat, which uh, I think it's a nice uh, version of, of that. So here's a, uh, okay, as I said, mathematicians like applications. So here's a, a pseudo application of this result. There's a theorem uh, on the archive by Denk. It's, uh, it's just, uh, on, just appeared on the archive recently, which says uh, it's an, uh, a version of the FIVEX2 result, which says that the moduli space of minimal complex projective manimal manifolds of general type is Kobayashi hyperbolic, which in essence says that there's a, there's a, a bound on the derivative of a map from the disk uh, to the moduli space. Um, so you can't have a, a huge disk inside the moduli space in some sense. <coughs> so, of course, this is already on the archive, and our result is not on the archive, so it doesn't quite use our result. He uses it in spirit. So he sent me a question, can you have a version, a, a tight version of your result? And we discussed it a bit, and it turns out that, in, that there's, a, there's a trick to go around that requirement. But in spirit, what he really needs is the tight version of the result. Okay, so I have a quarter of an hour, and what I want to uh, start doing is uh, say something about what's involved in proving results like that. And the first step is to read Janosch's chapter three in the book on resolution singularities and realize that one can actually understand this and work with this. It's, it's every algebraic geometry should prove this. And every algebraic geometer should do this and understand it and, and be happy that resolution of singularities in characteristic zero is not difficult. Okay, so that's the first step. Um, and then the second step is we are trying to prove something in, uh, in, on families, so we need to prove something about logarithmically smooth things. And thinking about the, about the case of zero-dimensional case, it implies that we better understand how to resolve singularities in the logarithmic setting. So suppose I have a, a logarithmic variety X, which is probably possibly singular, uh, and we want to resolve it. The first step, which is, so what I will say now is totally analogous to what is done in Janusz's book. Um, so you, you first embed the variety in something log smooth. That's something that only can be done locally, but it can be done locally. And uh, once it's embedded, then it has an ideal. Uh, so the question is now to do something algebraic on the ideal. And the algebraic step that is done on the ideal is called principalization. Uh, so this is a... An idea that already is in Hironaka, not exactly under this name. Uh, I'm not sure who introduced the name, but it certainly is in the rewrites of Hironaka by Villa Mayor uh, and his school and by Birsten and Milman. So, what, is, so uh, what we did is the logarithmic version of principalization. So here's the statement. Suppose I have an ideal on a logarithmically smooth variety. So that's just a toroidal variety. There is a Functorial logarithmic morphism, y prime to y, such that y prime is still logarithmically smooth, but something good happened to the ideal. The, now the ideal is an invertible monomial ideal. In the process, whenever you blow up, uh, it's customary to throw the exceptional locus into the boundary, so that's what we do. So, in essence, the ideal becomes an ideal of component, a monomial ideal of components of the boundary. So here's, a, a, here's an example. Here's, a, can you see all the colors here? So this is, 
u equals zero, which I, my, uh, the first variable is, uh, is a monomial, so it's drawn thick. So the, 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 log, the toroidal structure is given by this divisor. X equals zero is not a divisor of the toroidal structure, I, so I drew it in green in, in dashed form. And the ideal I want to monomialize is the ideal u squared x squared. So I, drew, I sort of sketched this zero scheme here. So I, as I said, u is a monomial, but x is not. If you blow up the origin, the ideal, uh, the, the total transform of the ideal becomes the ideal of the exceptional squared, so that is a monomial ideal. So that's an example of monomial, of, of principalization. So. <coughs> How is principalization done? Um, in the classical approach, one, uh, one uses order reduction. And in our case, we do logarithmic order reduction. So let me tell you about order reduction. So um, for calculating orders, we use logarithmic derivatives. So for a monomial, we only use the, the logarithmic derivative with respect to the monomial, namely u d by du. And for other variables, we use the usual derivative. So that, that spans the space of first order logarithmic uh, derivations, and that generates a, a, uh, a ring. So you write d less than or equal to a for the sheaf of logarithmic differential operators of order at most a. It's, uh, a vari the logarithmic variant of something that occurred in a lecture before when uh, differential operators, uh, um, the ring of differential uh, operators appeared, I think, in Popper's lecture. <coughs> and this is the natural filtration on that ring. Well, on the logarithmic version of that ring. So I define the logarithmic order of an ideal i to be the minimum number a, that's a number, such that the eighth, uh, applying the eighth derivative, uh, up the, the differential operators up to order a to i gives the unit ideal. So uh, we, uh, this, uh, this slide is, uh, is the... Uh, active learning slide of this lecture. So look carefully at the definition and tell me um, if I take u and v monomial, x a free variable, not, namely not a monomial, and p is the origin, what is the logarithmic order at the origin of this ideal, u squared comma x? It is one, that's true, because d by dx of x is one, is a unit, is, is so it but once you get to that, the ideal generated by that is the unit ideal. Uh, so what's the logarithmic order of this? It's 2, because if you take the derivative of x twice, you get 2, which is a unit, so it generates, in current is 0, it generates um, uh, the unit ideal. Uh, and, and this is also of order 2, logarithmic order 2, because with respect to v, I'm only taking the logarithmic derivative. So v, d by dv of v, does not reduce the order. So that's important because um, now let's look at the ideal v plus u. What's the logarithmic order of this ideal at the origin? <coughs> so this is the ideal of a line through the origin. Uh, in the uv plane, if you take a, the first derivative, you get v with respect to v. v, d by dv, you get v. u, d by du, you get u. And if you do it again, you, you keep there. So it is infinity. So this is something new that happens in the logarithmic situation. Uh, taking further and further derivatives, so this ideal is, uh, becomes, after a while, stable under logarithmic derivation. In, when you take usual differential operators, this only happens to the unit ideal, which keeps, you know, the, the trivial operator one keeps the unit ideal. 
And the zero ideal, which anything else, uh, if you have a variable, then the derivation will reduce order. In the logarithmic sense, uh, situation, there's more. And the question, the new ingredient in, in the discussion is what, um, what are... Um, what are these uh, and ideals that are stable under derivations? And so we define m of i to be the minimal monomial ideal containing i, and the claim is, and this, is, this appears, so we were really scared because it appeared in a preprint of color while we were working on this. So uh, in characteristic zero, the the minimal monomial ideal containing i is precisely the stabilized version, the differential stabilized version of the ideal. <coughs> so if it stabilizes, and that's the minimal monomial ideal containing i. In particular, uh, the order is infinity if and only if this ideal, the mo minimal monomial ideal containing i, is not the identity. So if your ideal doesn't vanish identically on a monomial stratum, on the on to, on toroidal stratum, then the, the order is finite, but if it does vanish on a stratum, then it is infinite. So this is the first part of the proposition. And here's a, a um, the, sort of the first step in order reduction. If you have something of infinite order, you want to reduce the order from infinite to finite. Uh, so if you no, blow up this ideal, the monomial part of uh, an ideal, and normalize, <coughs> then this is the same, uh, then, then taking the monomial part of the new ideal is the same as pulling back the monomial part of the old ideal. So mon taking monomial, monom the monomial saturation of an ideal is the commutes with monomial blowing up. Um, and since it's a blow-up, it is an invertible monomial ideal. In particular, uh, pulling back the original ideal, it becomes the product of a new ideal by a monomial ideal. And then that monomial idea is the full monomial part of this idea. So I0 has, has finite logarithmic order. So this is how you reduce order from infinite to finite. Um, all right, so... It's not hard to show that the pull that <coughs> so one implies two because um, this ideal is generated by differential operators applies to generators of i differential operators on y apply to generator of i and pulling back but uh, differential operators when you do a monomial blow up. Monomial blow up is log et al. So the pullback of differential operator on y just gives you differential operators on y0. So this ideal has the same generators as this ideal. So uh, that this, uh, so you use uh, the fact that um, it's stable under derivations uh, to um, to uh, show to show this fact. And because it is a blow-up, it becomes an invertible monomial ideal. So the key to this proposition is part one. Uh, so this is the one thing I want to prove. In a very special case, this is a special case that is already in Kohler's, uh, um, in Kohler's paper. Uh, Kohler was, it's a special case of Kohler's paper. Suppose that we are looking at affine space. The xi are free variables and the, the toroidal structure, the, the divisor, is defined by the ui. And assume that uh, you have a, an ideal that is stable under derivation. I want to say that this ideal is generated by monomial. This is what part one says. Um, so how do you prove such a thing? Uh, well, you use linear algebra. You have operators. Uh, acting on this ring, uh, which commute, namely these operators. These are commuting operators. And they are, the action is diagonalizable, because so <coughs> the eigenvalues uh, are, the eigenspaces are precisely monomial times polynomials in the x's. 
Um, that, that, those are the eigenspaces. Um, in particular, if an ideal is stable and derivation, then it necessarily is of the form direct sum of u times mu, where mu are ideals in the, in the polyno are polynomial ideals in the excess. Moreover, I'm assuming that it's not just stable under these derivations, but also by, under derivation with respect to the xi. And in the usual situation, the only stable ideals are, um, uh, are 0 and 1. In other words, m is a monomial ideal, and, and that's the proof in this case. The general case requires more uh, commutative algebra, and, uh, and thank you for your attention. I stop four seconds before the, my time. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So <coughs> questions? Yes. What are the next ten slides? Oh wait, there's a slide before where I sketched uh, something about um, how you complete uh, order reduction, but le uh, let me not go through it. What I want to say is, uh, I mean, what the next 10 slides are, if I had 20 more minutes, I would go uh, and explain um, what happens when the dimension is bigger than one in an example. And I would explain um, 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 something very uh, surprising about this logarithmic factoriality, which is if you uh, that factoriality doesn't work for varieties. So somehow we realize that we have to prove um, the resolution factorial for logarithmically smooth maps. For instance, a map between toric varieties is log. A, the map of a toric variety, any story, a singular toric variety to a point is a, a log smooth map. So it has to be factorial with that. In particular, a toric variety is not resolved at all in this procedure because it, the, the resolution is a pullback of a resolution of a point. Um, and if you, if you accept that you need to do functorial logarithmic resolution, it doesn't work for varieties. You have to use something that I learned from the person I mentioned, Angelo Vistel, namely you have to use algebraic stacks. And in the realm of algebraic stacks, the theorem applies. So I never said in the theorem where it applies. It applies to stacks and not to varieties. That's a, a nice surprise that we got while proving the result. Questions? So I have a question. Um, if you start with a flat morphism instead of just dominant, mm -hmm. do you get more out of the modification? Can you say more or it doesn't matter? Um. At the end you get a flat morphism, right? But if At the end you get a flat morphism. A flat but, um, morphism. I I can't think of an advantage that you get in the procedure right now. Okay. So the first step is to do a, what we, I call toroidalization. And um, so one of the things we use in the toro, I mean, we use flat name. So. OK, flat name, OK. All right. So I guess, yeah, so, so at one point, we skip the flattening. Uh, uh, flattening uh, pullback, but we need we get to use it again and again. In the, uh, so if you start, then it doesn't re doesn't absolve you from using flattening. Okay. All right. So if there are no more questions, let's thank Dan again. <laughs>